the degree to which a culture demonstrates honor and respect for individual lives reflects the degree to which the justice system of that nation either protects all lives or encourages the death of certain lives. And with that, I welcome you to the program today, Stand in the Gap. I'm Sam Rohr, and I'm going to be joined in just a moment by Pastor Isaac Crockett. Now today is part two of a two-part series that we've entitled, It's a Matter of Life and Death. Once the foundation of morality, right and wrong, and absolute truth is established, then the consideration of such critical issues as the value of life can be established. Once an understanding of foundational law built on unchanging moral standards is identified and embraced, then consistent public policy can be established and equitable law and law enforcement system and a just system of justice can be expected. Public policy debates surrounding the issue of life and death uh, predictable justice or changing injustice, the view of faith, or love, or God, or right and wrong, or the value of all life, or the sliding scale value of life hinging on someone else's view of contribution to society ultimately hinges on one's world view. A person's world view starts with how we believe we got here. Now, if I got here by accident, that's what I believe, and it came through the deception of Darwinian evolution, then what life or what value has? What life has value? Especially, no sacred value, and, and it can be cavalierly destroyed. However, if you and I are here because God created us unique, individual, valuable, and sacred, then all of life has value and eternal purpose. Life then must be protected. But the difference of these worldviews form the foundational difference between the views toward life and death, truth and deception, justice and injustice, freedom or bondage. So joining me again today is Scott Klusendorf, who is the founder and the president of Life Training Institute. Scott is perhaps one of the nation's leading life apologists and spends a great deal of time training high school and college age young people in particular, but our culture also at large. And with that, welcome back to the program today. Scott, uh, we're glad that you're back with us and look forward to completing this two-part series. Good to be with you, Sam and Isaac. Uh, Scott, uh, just, as a, just as a little piece of uh, review, um, in the program last week, we connected the concepts of truth and um, absolute truth, and we talk about natural law and rights coming from God as a way of helping to establish um, uh, the concept of uh, the value of life. And of course, this is in the context of you teaching young people, which you just said in the last program, many of them have say they've heard it for the first time. They never heard about truth or life. So here's my question here to you, just kind of put some of this together. Um, this is more of a a, a, a bit of a why, I suppose, but how do you go about establishing at those early stages of talking with a young person, how do you go about establishing the foundation for life as being valuable? How do you do it? Well, the, fir the first thing we do is help students understand that when we make a claim that abortion is wrong, we are not talking about what we like or prefer. Our culture tends to think of moral truth claims as being like claims about ice cream. You like chocolate, I like vanilla, who are we to judge? But when I say that something is wrong, I'm not talking about personal preference. I'm talking about what's right or wrong regardless of my preferences. For example, my 87-year-old father-in-law loves to collect Corvettes. And he's got a new one sitting in his garage out in L.A. where I'll be in a few weeks. I would love to take that Corvette on a joy ride while he's away skiing. Yeah, at 87, he still skis and drive up PCH past Pepperdine, past Malibu and have a great ride. But I won't do that because though I would like to do it, it would be wrong to take the car without his permission. 
And our culture today, Sam, doesn't know the difference between a claim about ice cream and a claim about truth. So we always start by helping students understand the difference between a claim about what we like and a claim about what's objectively right or objectively wrong. And like I said in the first episode, we start often with imagery that conveys truths at the visceral level that reawaken moral intuitions in a way that words alone cannot. And from that, we build our scientific and philosophic case for the pro-life view. Hmm. Excellent, Scott. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to come back. We're going to pick up on that. As Scott was saying, sometimes they have to reawaken. They have to actually shock the young person into understanding that some of what they've been seeing is, you know, is you got to grip them. But once they're gripped, we're going to come back, we're going to talk to Scott, but then how he then takes and talks to them about the idea that, uh, you know, that pre-born baby, that baby that you don't see, does that pre-born baby have as much value as the person who you can see? Truth, flexible or permanent? The Bible, ancient history, or powerfully relevant. Culture, a reflection of enlightenment or warning signs. The pastor, commentator, or frontline combatant. Every day, American Pastors Network speaks to these questions where and when they matter. With hundreds of affiliate radio stations nationwide, a website and mobile app screening today's headlines through the twin lenses of the Bible and the Constitution. Educating, informing, equipping. This is the American Pastors Network. The time is now to stand in the gap for truth. Welcome back to Stand in the Gap, and we're talking literally about a matter of life and death. That's the, the name of this program. This is part two, and we're talking with Scott Klusendorf. And, and Scott, uh, you train young people especially about the apologetics of life. Uh, and, you know, some people are thinking, well, why, why do we even need to do that? And maybe you're watching this and you're thinking, well, why, do, why is this so important? I'm with you. I'm, I'm pro-life. But do you know why you're pro-life, and do you know how to help other people? Maybe your children, your grandchildren, a nephew, a niece, a neighbor kid, or somebody from church. You say, well, my church is pro-life. But are the kids really understanding, and are they able to defend what they believe? And Scott, what you're doing um, at uh, ProLifeTraining.com, www.ProLifeTraining.com, uh, as the president of Pro-Life Training Institute, this is so vitally important to our culture, to our churches, to our families. One of the things I'm so excited about when I've taken my kids into Washington, D.C. for the National uh, March for Life or other, uh, other events to you know, stand places and do things, is that I see so many young people. In fact, when I go to the National <laughs> um, March for Life, I feel like an old person uh, because most of the people there are teenagers or college-age students doing this. So it's neat to see that happening. And if you know young people and you don't know their position on this subject, I would invite you to go back and listen to part one of this program, listen to this again, share it with them, and, and look at what Scott is doing uh, because this is just vitally important. So Scott, let's, let's go into this. Romans chapter 2, Paul makes it very clear that with God it says that there is no respect of persons with God. But as you talk to young people, Sometimes this idea of value of life is, well, some people aren't really people. They're not really persons. There's this kind of this give or take. Certain situations, they're not really, is that really a life? Is that really a person? For example, the preborn baby. How do you address that with them? Well, the first thing we do is show that their view results in savage inequality. Uh, they love equality. This generation is obsessed with equality and they want marital equality. You can marry your canary if you want to. They want social equality. They want income equality. And that's why this generation is more or less trending leftward towards socialism. But what they need to understand, and we point out to them, is that when you embrace what we call a performance view of human value, meaning humans aren't valuable in virtue of the kind of thing they are, which is the endowment view, Rather, they're only valuable because of some performance they can do, like having self-awareness 
or the ability to feel pain or language, whatever they pick out as being uh, essential. If you embrace that performance view, then it follows human equality is thrown on the ash heap of history. And here's why. If my value is based, for example, on self-awareness, and you, Isaac, have more self-awareness than I do, then you are more of a person than I am. You have more fundamental rights than I do, which means you can take the concept of equality and throw it on the ash heap of history. Well, students don't like that. They don't want inequality. So we can make a better case for equality than the secularist can. The other thing we do is point out that their position is totally arbitrary. Who are you to pick out what traits matter? You say it's self-awareness. I say it's a belly button that points out rather than in. Who are you to judge me and say I'm wrong? We can play that card against them, that whole relativistic standard they love to throw in our face. So we show them that their position is totally uh, without foundation, that it's arbitrary and actually results in savage inequality. So you bring up a next question that's, that's very personal for me. Um, Sam knows this, but my, so my wife was adopted instead of aborted and uh, her parents that adopted her, her father was adopted instead of aborted. Uh, her mother's family, they adopted and fostered many, many children, most of them or many of them special needs, uh, physically, mentally, developmentally. I've worked uh, with a lot of different patients and students. I'm thinking right now of several autistic students I worked with who were completely nonverbal. So from the performance view of things, of whether you're a person or not, these people would be discounted as not people. And yet God says that there's no respect of persons. Uh, how do you get that point in there? How do you build into that, what you're talking about now? How do you kind of flesh out those nuances with young people who uh, culture is kind of pushing this performance view on them? We help them see the distinction between intrinsic dignity and attributed dignity. And our culture, again, confuses these two concepts. Attributed dignity is something we would give, for example, to a university professor based on his learning. Uh, suppose you're going to the local university and Dr. Jones has two doctorates, one in physics, one in uh, epistemology, meaning philosophy. Well, we would rightly attribute to him academic credit. We would say to him, you know, this guy has really applied himself. And we attribute to him the dignity of his office as professor. Then let's take, though, a beach bum. A beach bum wastes his life laying on the beach all day long and doing nothing. Well, we don't attribute to him the same academic or vocational dignity that we do the professor. However, just because the two are not equal in terms of attributed dignity does not mean they're not equal in terms of their intrinsic or fundamental dignity. The beach bum and the university professor have equal intrinsic dignity, though they don't have equal attributed dignity. And in fact, what makes the beach bum's life a waste to us, why we think he's wasting his life, is because he's failing to flourish according to his objective nature, while the university professor has done a better job flushing out or living according to his nature and flourishing in a way that benefits all of us. So that distinction between attributed dignity and intrinsic dignity can help students see that there really is a difference, and it's the intrinsic dignity that grounds the right to life. Hmm. And what you are describing, Scott, brings me to the next question here. You didn't actually say it, but you're describing it, and that is worldview. You are describing a view of life. Uh, on this program, and on our um, Stand in the Gap uh, radio programs, we emphasize over and over again a biblical worldview. So, when you are talking to young people and you are taking the concepts that you've laid out, how do you take and wrap them into the bigger picture that we would call a, bibli a, a worldview? Do you actually say there is a biblical worldview and it is God and thus and thus and so? How do you do that and why do you do that? And I, I'd also like to know, I mean, how, to what extent have you seen it effective in being able to be 
um, the hinge, the, the, the hooks for these young people to take and um, take these concepts of truth and to fix them in their minds. Explain that, how you do that. We don't start by saying to students, the Bible says that human beings have value because they're made in the image of God. We make that point in our presentations, but we start with language and with arguments that are accessible to them that they cannot dismiss. Keep in mind, students today tend to think that religious truth claims don't count as real knowledge. They're mere subjective opinion. So we start with something that they will embrace, which is a rational argument for the pro-life view using science and philosophy. Then we quickly pivot to show that without our dignity, being grounded in the concept of a transcendent creator might makes right. Who's ever in power will decide who counts and who doesn't, and they will decide which traits count and which ones don't. But we also point out to students that there's a fundamental worldview idling behind the abortion debate, and they need to be aware of that worldview. And that worldview is what we call body self dualism. Body self dualism says uh, that you, Sam, have nothing to do with your body. The real you is only your thoughts, your cognitive abilities, and maybe your ability to interact with others. But the real you has nothing to do with your physical body. And until you have certain cognitive levels of efficiency, you don't even exist as a person. You're just a physical body, which is nothing more than evolutionary blind matter in motion. Now, that is opposite the biblical worldview, where human beings are a dynamic union of body and soul, and we reflect the image of God in the totality of our being. Uh, the Bible rejects this notion, which is really a Gnostic notion, that there's this strict division between the mental you and the bodily you. No, we're a dynamic union. In fact, those of you watching this show right now, you're looking at me, your eyes are physically taking in the image, but it's your mind that's making sense of what you see. We are a dynamic union of body and soul. And the culture has largely thrown that out. The only thing that matters in the body self dualistic worldview is what you think. And this is what justifies transgenderism. This is what justifies identifying as a man if you're really a woman. The argument goes that if in my thoughts, which are the real me, my body is something other than it is physically, well, then it's only my thoughts or desires that matter, not my body. And this plays out in abortion. People say, well, that fetus doesn't yet have cognitive thoughts. It's not aware of itself existing over time. Therefore, the fetus isn't even a being yet. It's just a mass of physical body. Uh, and that's that body self dualism that is uh, undermining the biblical worldview, which is that each of us have value because we bear the image of our maker. Uh, Scott, just excellent. And this makes me think that when you're explaining these kinds of things to young people, I am sure there's a lot of thoughts, <laughs> talking about thoughts, going through their minds, just out of interest. Um, if there is a leading question that you hear from young people, what is that leading question that all of this causes them to ask you? Uh, a leading question might be something like, okay, I get that you, you believe that the embryo is alive, but how can you say it's a person when it doesn't even have any uh, thoughts yet? It's not self-aware. And Instead of doing what a lot of pro-lifers do, they, they, they take the bait at that point and they respond by saying something like, well, the embryo has brainwaves by week six and, and can dream by week 10. Wrong answers. You just bought the premise of their objection, namely that it's self-awareness which gives us value. I push back on that. I challenge the premise and I'll say to them, tell me, why do I have to be self-aware not to be intentionally dismembered? And I make them defend their claim. They made the claim that self-awareness is what gives me value. It's on them to defend it, not me. I make them defend it. Then I point out to them that their answer is going to be totally arbitrary and that there's no foundational basis for it. And if they're going to argue that cognitive ability is what gives us value, then that means those who have more of it have a greater right to life than those who have less. And they're uh, obsession with human equality has just been tossed out the window. Th that is superb, uh, Scott. Really, uh, really it is. Ladies and gentlemen, we're about at the end of the program. Uh, we need to wrap this thing up and we come back in just a moment with Scott. We're going to give some, some 
some concluding thoughts uh, to this program now, which is part two of these two-part series, It Is a Matter of Life and Death. Stand in the Gap is produced and recorded in the studios of Lighthouse TV, positively different television. Welcome back to Stand in the Gap. And as we wrap up this literally a matter of life or death, that's the name of the program. This is the part two. Uh, I want to go to you real quickly here, Scott. As somebody's watching this, and maybe there's somebody in mind, a family member, a friend, a coworker, and they're thinking, you know, Scott, you just took these ideas and, and you really made it understandable. But how do I bridge that gap? How do I, without, you know, studying all of this, how do I take those feelings and convert it into a question that, that bridges this gap? What, what do you say to that? Yeah, great question. Here's your question you put to somebody. Do you believe that each and every human being has an equal right to life or not? In other words, do you believe that every human you've met has an equal right to life regardless of their race, gender, size, development, location, or do you believe only some people have it in virtue of some trait that may come and go in the course of their lifetime. If they argue that they believe each and every human being has a right to life, you then simply say, okay, fair enough. Then that means if the unborn are human and the science of embryology indicates they are, then you would agree they have the same right to life as all of us. And that's usually when the excuses begin. Oh, well, they're not self-aware. And you can simply point out that these objections are arbitrary and result in savage inequality, as we've already discussed. That's a great point, Scott. And I, I know I've done this with young people and older people alike. And just that first question about, you know, this, because everyone wants to be tolerant, it, it just wakes them up. I mean, you just see this kind of dumbfounded look on their face, like, so if they're human, that's great. Real quickly here, as uh, we, we go, we, we've called this a matter of life and death. How important is this topic of value of life? How important is that to our nation as a whole and to God's blessing or judgment upon us as a result? It's absolutely foundational. The reason why the abortion issue is so contentious in our country, and by the way, it's a good thing it is, because in other places like Europe, the abortion issue is largely settled. It's a non-issue. We don't ever want that to happen here. The reason it's contentious Isaac, is that we are as a nation having a debate over who counts as one of us. And just like that issue was divisive in Lincoln's time, it's divisive in our time. And we need to answer that question correctly as Christians. Who counts as one of us? The answer is very simple. Anyone who bears the image of his maker. And that means all humans. And Scott, you could not have concluded the program any better than that. And ladies and gentlemen, I hope you understand. Do you realize in this, as we, most of you are watching this right now, you would say that you are a Christian, you fear God. Do you realize what we're talking about goes to the very heart of who God is? The giver of life, the, the one who sustains life, the one who gives us, if you've trusted Christ as your Savior, spiritual life, if we do not speak, ladies and gentlemen, about the value of life as God defended and designed it to be, then all we're left with is death. I don't want to be in a country like that, do you? Well, that's partly why we're here, to lift up the standard of truth. And I hope on this program today, you, you've got some better thoughts perhaps in how to articulate the value of life and why you and I need not just to hold it within our own heart, but articulate it, defend it, extend it, carry it out. It is, in fact, a matter of life and death. Well, thanks for watching us today here on the program. And again, this week, I encourage you, if you've enjoyed these two programs, let us know 
We can do more of these kinds of things, but uh, we want you to be equipped. That is our purpose, that is our goal, and that is our prayer. Pray for us this week. Stand in the gap with us in prayer and with finances so that we can continue with God's grace and God's help to do more of this proclaiming of truth into the public square across these United States. Thank you for being with us today. And again and again, I ask you to pray with us, join with us, and be with us again next week.